Hello everyone and welcome back to the Kia Ora Theatre and the Linux Conf Australia 2022. I'm really excited for this next talk and I hope that everyone uh, enjoys it as much as I will. Uh, Jay Rosenbaum is a Melbourne-based AI artist and researcher working with 3D modelling, artificial intelligence and extended reality technologies. Their work explores post-human and post-gender concepts using classical art combined with new media technologies and programming. Their presentation today is a Dungeons and Dragons themed talk about AI and ethics using incredible tools to defeat the beasts of bias. And I understand slides will be available afterwards and a beta D&D module if you want to try it at your table, which sounds incredible. There's also a transcript linked in the chat in Venulus if you are hard of hearing or have voluntary processing issues. Over to you. Thank you so much. You've all heard the stories. A community is being attacked by a monster night after night. It erodes the foundations of the village. The, the town people are terrified. It whispers in their ears and tries to turn their minds. It seems to feed off their very souls. Night after night it returns. There's no reprieve, no surrender. It undermines everything the good and lawful people of the town work for. Those who succumb to the whispers slowly lose their ideals and their dreams of a better tomorrow. They lose their friends. They lose enjoyment in their favourite things. They're enslaved to it now and work for the monster's benefit, not their own. You come to the centre of the village, the epicentre of the devastation, and behold an aberrant creature like you have never seen before. I'm going to need you all to roll for initiative. The monster is an aberrant pile of ooze atop a once golden automaton. Inside, you see some tarnished metal glinting as the ooze shifts and moves around. A creature that spews bile and slurs. It interrupts you as you try to talk to it. It's unceasing in its desire to squash those it deems lesser under its treads. You put up a valiant battle. Swords slashing, magic firing and arcane bursts. The very trees come to your aid. With each attack, ooze separates from the automaton. Sometimes it joins the battle and turns into a creature. Sometimes the ooze evaporates and you see more of the metal showing. Just as you feel like you're starting to make some headway the, against the black, bilious eye core surrounding the machine, it turns and flees. As it leaves, small bits of ooze drop off and fly or crawl away. Turning your attention to the crowd milling around you now, you sense that they're grateful for your aid. But they tell you that others have tried and succeeded in chasing it off. And still, it returns again and again. You know deep in your hearts that it will return unless the source is dealt with. You need to find out where it comes from, why it attacks, and how to slay it once and for all. Welcome to the campaign against AI. Against algorithmic bias in AI. I'm your DM, Jay Rosenbaum, and I will be talking today about two of my passions bias in AI and DD. I'm a PhD student in my final year at RMIT exploring computer perceptions of gender, and I research a great deal about AI bias and mitigation. One of my major projects involves visibly debiasing a generative adversarial network to show how bias affects image generation and how it is possible to alter the bias of a biased neural network. This talk is a bit of a fun look at how you can seek out the issues in AI and view AI through a critical lens. AI bias is a monster that doesn't stop. It's constantly coming back. Some people allow it to run rampant and some work to fight and, and subdue it. I want to look at this monster and how we can break it down bit by bit to turn it from a horrifying aberration into a tiny nuisance where you can go to get the information you need to fight it and how to go equip yourselves against the battle that lies ahead of you. 
Your party is tasked with subduing the creature or slaying it. Asking around town, you meet many who have been tainted by the whispers, some to a greater or lesser degree. The ones with little affect just seem to suffer from apathy. Why bother, they tell you? The monster's just going to return. Maybe we should just stop fighting. Others are almost hostile. All lives matter, they say. Or, well, actually, they say. You sigh and move on. In a local tavern, you sit over your drinks, despondently wondering where to start. When you hear a soft, I think I can help you. And you look up to see a traveling bard who tells you that he has been seeking adventurers to help with this terrifying quest. The bard tells you how the creature fights, that it has tendrils of O's that learn and attack. It tells you how it, he tells you how it attacks and works in whispers, destroying the morale of those around it, how it can subtly corrupt the people nearby. It doesn't feed on meat or people or any known food source. It feeds on the in hatred and the doubts of people and allows them to grow and fester as it returns again and again. Despairing, afraid of this monumental task in front of you, you ask, where can you even start with something like this? Can it even be done? The bard sighs, yes, he believes. It can be done. It wasn't always like this. There have been other villagers who have had different experiences with the creature. It seems to be getting worse as it moves from town to town. It needs to be confronted at the source, in its lair, to truly stop it. Your quest, therefore, is to find the lair and work together to defeat this creature. He also knows of someone who can help, who may be able to help you gain more information about the creature in a gleaming tower to the east. He hints that other villagers along the way may have further clues, additional information about the creature. It appears to be a huge task to slay the monster of AI bias. It has so many different permutations, so many different ways to appear. We hear about aspects of AI bias all the time. All of the different things that can go wrong when an AI is not properly trained from the beginning to consider all of the wonderful variations of humanity. In computer vision in particular, we see examples of misgendering, racist miscategorization, homophobia, transphobia, sexism. I constantly see examples of people using AI to decide who to police, to classify gender, to ensure that hateful content is shown in social media or to add misgendering and sexism to language translation. This is a problem that extends offline too, as many people are arrested on the word of an algorithm without due process. Bias is a particularly large problem in AI and computer science. Many of the researchers working in AI are men with 80% of AI professors and 72% of presenters at AI conferences. These numbers go on to influence the creation of data sets that are heavily male-focused. Bias in AI leads to harmful algorithms that can be used for unethical practices that can actively harm women and gender and sexual minorities. An AI was created to undress women using a pornography data set to fill in the unseen areas. While the initial algorithm was quickly removed by the creator after backlash from the AI community, many clones appeared shortly after. AI has been used to attempt to detect homosexuality with several algorithms created using data sets based on photographs from Grindr and Tinder in an attempt to explore a modern physiognomy of detection. These algorithms exist, and while they don't work properly, they were created without any consideration for people who could be put at risk because of the bias of AI's creators. Bias works insidiously to illustrate to people who are excluded that they don't matter, that they are less important. And these concepts prevent people from moving ahead, from being hired, from being seen. 
and from seeing others like them. As Dr. Sarah Lewis put it in her article on the racial bias built into photography, you can't become what you can't accurately see. If you cannot see others like yourself represented in power, in art, in literature and entertainment, then you start believing almost that you don't exist, that you don't matter. Bias can also propel the people who are represented to ignore and exclude those who aren't or people they don't view as the default. Bias leads to racism, to fear and hatred. And while we're in the nascent stages of teaching AI, it is crucial that we teach it that all humans have equal value. A neural network can even develop biases because of background data. Even if the background content is unlabeled, researchers have found that children in the background of an image usually results in the foreground person being classified as a woman because women appear with children in the background more often, even in a balanced data set. This sort of background noise reinforces the very bias we're trying to eliminate. We see entirely too often these issues being dismissed or fixed with a quick fix solution that doesn't really work to solve the underlying problem. It seems insurmountable to get past these issues. AI amplifies the worst biases of humanity and spews it forth, which then encourages people to be worse because they see their inner beliefs manifested and it becomes a vicious cycle. But there is hope. There are ways to debias AI to mitigate the problems caused by improper data sets and biased code. It helps to know that there are people out there who know what they're doing. There are experts in AI bias and there are resources to help you learn. The Algorithmic Justice League can help audit AI development and there are independent AI ethics experts available for consultation. Just knowing that there are people and resources you can turn to starts to break the task down into more manageable pieces. The path to the tower heads through several villages, each showing signs of the automaton passing through. Each one seems to tell a story of the creature's regression. From the villages that are mostly wreckage to recovering, to barely damaged at all. The villagers in each town tell you of the automaton as it moved through. And working backwards, you can see that it started off helpful, but as it moved from one village to the next and met with more people, something seemed to shift inside the creature. As you make your way to the place where it all began, you see the amounts of ooze all over everything taper off until there's no ooze to be seen. You see warped looking parrots occasionally as you track flying around and signs of tread moving away from the direction you're walking. The verdant fields give way to grasslands and the grasslands give way to a rocky plain. On the way, the bard tells tales of how the creature was created. He knows how to spin a yarn. And before you know it, you find yourself getting lost in the bard's words. An artificer, a wizard, a bard, all joined together to create something. They wanted to forge something to help people all over the world. Wanting to bring the best of themselves into this creature, they channeled their hearts and their souls, as well as their minds and the sweat of their brows into this creation. Surrounding the automaton were three motes of potential. Glowing lights to help the creature become whatever it can be. However, the tiny seeds of corruption that lay in their, each of their hearts, that lay in all of our hearts, unknown to us, were drawn out to, with the motes of potential and lay dormant until fed. They had the best of intentions as they set the creature off to go help the villagers. But the more time it spent with people, the more it changed. As it was exposed to the worst in people, that tiny seed of corruption grew. 
It fed off the corruption of others. And little by little, their golden dream turned into an aberrant nightmare. They watched as ooze started to creep up the sides of their creation. It was subtle at first, the change. First, it was just a little rude, answering back. Then it was oddly casual about accidentally hurting people. And then it began to shift to become something they could no longer control. It started to injure villagers for no reason. And then one day, it was simply gone. The three disagreed as to how to proceed and split up. The wizard chose to stay at the tower to research a way to fix it. The artificer went to find the lair of the creature and the bard went forth to see what assistance could be granted, any way to fix the devastation wrought in the neighbouring towns and hopefully find a group of brave adventurers to tackle this challenge. So many people start off their AI creations with the very best of intentions. They consider what they can do without thinking about whether they should. They want to benefit people, but don't necessarily think about which people and what that impact will be. Sometimes they just want to make something to see if it can be done. The problem is, is that we all have bias. That is the tiny seed of corruption. All our unknown unconscious biases. Just knowing that you have inbuilt biases will help you start to see them and learn to factor them in and work past them. The issue with this monster of AI bias is that the creators are three white men. One method they could have used early on is to ensure that they had a diverse team working to create the creature. It isn't enough to want to help people. You need the perspectives of many people in order to ensure that no one is overlooked. AI is lazy. It will only work with what it's taught. So it's up to every AI creator to ensure that it is taught a wide range of options so that it treats everyone equally. AI is like a child. It needs to be raised with gentle and positive reinforcement and it needs to be exposed to a wide range of experiences and people so that it does not get confused when presented with something outside of its knowledge. Lack of diversity in development has led to issues like Apple's facial recognition issues with Asian people and UK AI-based passport checker repeatedly telling black people that they need to ha that they have their mouths open. It has led to Google's image miscategorization and to the development of the highly secretive company Palantir, who work in defense and counterterrorism. AI is about using math to make predictions, about using the data it is given to extrapolate new ideas. This can be extremely powerful. But AI has also been proven to focus on the wrong things. We need diverse teams developing AI systems so that we can ensure that the motes of potential from everyone are included, but that the seeds of corruption are minimized by contrasting viewpoints. But what do you do if the AI is already biased? How do you progress from there? Stay tuned. As you see the how a tower looming on the horizon, gleaming in the setting sun, you hear a raucous cry from behind you and feel the impact of whispers on your mind. The parrots, who seemed so few and far away, have increased in number and are milling around you, entering your minds with doubts and questions. Their feathers look like individual droplets of ooze. These are stochastic parrots filled with bile and corruption, but not always able to express themselves well. The fight against the parrots is taxing. Individually, they're not strong, but as a swarm, they pick away at your defences, your hit points and your stamina. 
They attack your mind with dissonant whispers designed to feed that tiny seed of corruption inside you. But you are strong. And eventually the stochastic parrots are defeated. And as the sun dips below the horizon, you set up camp for a long rest. Stochastic parrot is an AI term for very large language models for natural language processing systems. These are often trained with a huge amount of information dragged from all over the internet. And the reliability of the text is not great. After all, when your data set includes Reddit, how biased will your results be? The paper, the paper that Timnit Gebru and later Mark Mitchell were fired from Google over discusses the problems of stochastic parrots at length. And I felt it was appropriate to not only include these as low level encounters, but also to generate an insult table using AI for some quality insults. Quality. It was challenging to generate insults that were not biased towards any particular group of people. And ironically, I couldn't use the biggest stochastic parrot of them all, GPT-3, because its, ins its results were almost entirely bigoted. I ended up using a smaller model insult generator. Excuse me. Stochastic parrots are an ongoing problem in AI because we frankly have become a little lazy in the method of data set creation. We want huge data sets, but are often unwilling to go to the trouble of creating every image or piece of training text within, let alone working to ensure that every part is unbiased. I'm sure that the original intent was to bring everything in and let the AI sort it out and hope for the best, but you all know what happens when you put garbage in. We still have not lived down the creation of Tay, the Microsoft AI on Twitter that turned into a rabid Nazi. More recently, our imagination has been captured by Ask Delphi, a large language model which claims to make ethical judgments. After being taken to task, the creators have put a lot of disclaimers on the site acknowledging the bias. Lately, people have been turning to smaller language models again and training on better chosen and curated data sets. And this is paying off. It's more work. It's always more work to do the right thing, but the end result pays off. Another way of cutting corners is by using mass worker groups like Amazon's Mechanical Turk to caption images. In this way, as with AI, you have to be extremely careful with what you ask and you need to supervise the outcomes carefully. A recent study by MIT of popular public data sets showed label errors up to 3.4% of the time. In ImageNet, that amounts to 4, uh, 482,702 uh, 482, images, excuse me. Some of these are harmless like labeling a chihuahua as a feather boa. But it gets more insidious when it comes to images of humans. When doing research into the MS Coco dataset, I spoke to the creators about how the image descriptions were created. They were written by MTurk workers with a set of instructions. These instructions, however, did not go far enough into determining what should and should not be included in the caption. At no point does it really explain what the important parts are or how to determine them. What is important for one person may not be important for another. Same with describing unimportant details. I browsed the online data set looking for the above example to see the captions that were written and came across a number of captions that described women in photographs as beautiful or very sexy. The only value judgment I saw of a man was described as very large. I would posit that value judgments are not important to the captioning process as everyone has different views of attractiveness. But that's also not critical to the story. Some further instruction would prevent that. I also saw occasional examples where the person was merely a hand or the person was so small 
that they could not be identified, and yet an attempt was made to gender them. Having people go through the caption results and remove those that didn't follow the instructions would have also been useful. This sounds like a lot of extra work, but in the end, isn't it worth the extra work at the beginning to avoid the harder task of eventually having to fight a battle against a corrupted AI? You finally reach the tower and start to climb. As you make your way to the top, you see workrooms, storage rooms with powered down automatons of all kinds. Some look like they're made for fighting, others for gardening or building. They all seem to have a singular purpose built into them and they all seem to be completely inert. Some are intact and others appear to have been scavenged for parts. It is a slightly grisly scene that repeats as on your journey to the top. At the top of the tower, you meet the wizard. He's weedy with a golden band holding his long hair back from his face. He wipes his brow and set down his book as you come in, his face resigned. He knows why you're here. As you explain the story, his face falls. He sighs at the end of your tale and sits down dejectedly. I knew this would happen, he said. I told them it wasn't ready to go out in public yet. This was all supposed to be a bit of an exploration into something that could help people. We didn't know it would get so bad so fast, he continues. I hate the idea of taking it down, but I see we have no choice. We need to reset it at the very least, but if you can find a way to remove the corruption without destroying it, that would be best. I think we can save it. I think there's good in it yet. And I think I have an idea of how that might work. He tells you that the automaton is not to blame, but the corruption surrounding it. And if you take out the corruption, you may have a chance to save the machine itself. If you can bring it back to the tower, he and the others can help reverse their mistakes. He tells you that the corruption, like the machine, has the power to learn, to grow and shift and that adventurers such as yourselves need to be especially wary of its need to adapt and to change up your attacks and skills to keep it guessing. He suggests magical weapons may be of more use and has some for sale. If you ask about the creatures that attacked you on your journey, he tells you that sometimes ooze separates from the aberration and becomes its own creature, its own monster. The stochastic parrots learn by listening to conversations and repeating the words they've heard, twisting them into bizarre insults. There are other creatures too, sloppy creatures with claws and a comical appearance. They exist only to mock those who would destroy them. While the individual monsters are not much of a challenge to kill, there do seem to be more and more about, of them about these days. Finally. He tells you that he has a telescope and has seen a trail of ooze heading into and out of a swamp nearby. He has seen signs that it may be coming and going from there and may have a lair somewhere in the swamp. AI creators often consider their own needs and wants when making something. They don't always consider the impact their creation will have or the way it will react or affect some users. When thinking about whether you should make something, ask yourself, who does this help? Then ask yourselves, who could this harm? And look at your team. If you don't see the types of people most likely to be affected, then you need to broaden your team. If they all look like you, then you need to consider who you are making this for and why. Bring in consultants, put the question out on Twitter. Bias in AI most often comes down to two major areas, the data set and the original concept. What do you want to do and how do you want to do it? It's very easy to get carried away with an idea and want to develop it straight away, but you need to consider, is this something that will help people? Is this something that could hurt people inadvertently? 
Fixing the problem at the beginning before it becomes a giant monster is much easier than at the end. And sometimes the best idea is never to start at all. In any form of AI-based production, the ethics of what you are making should be part of the initial risk assessment. You do make risk assessments, right? You head towards the swamp. As you enter, doubt starts to build in all of you. A sense of dread at the monumental size of this task. You gathered information and you head into the dense undergrowth, full of anticipation and concern. What will you find? As you hack and fight your way through the undergrowth, it seems to grow darker and the light is swallowed up by the vegetation. Even the bard, who's been merrily playing along up until now, starts to change his tune to a more sonorous melody filled with dread. You don't even know if he's conscious of it as he does it. As you venture further into the darkness, your hearts sink more and more with each passing step. Just as it feels you can't go any further, a little glowing moat, a tiny golden music note appears in front of you and starts swirling around the bard. That tiny light is like a ray of hope and your legs feel lighter, your mind's clearer. As you get deeper into the heart of the jungle, another moat appears, a shining blue quill that seems to beckon on you onwards. <coughs> Excuse me. You emerge into a clearing with a metallic structure built into the trees and a small hillock. In front of it is a glowing moat shaped like a green spanner and all three start circling the bard. As you face the metallic structure and square your shoulders, a wild-eyed man bursts from the undergrowth. He shakes his spanner at the bard and says, you! But whatever he was going to say after that is immaterial, as the automaton emerges from its lair and attacks. Where before you felt completely steamrolled, now you understand more about the machine. You're ready. You know it learns and adapts. You know the ooze is to blame. You bring all of your attacks to bear. Little oozes drop off it and join the attack, but now you notice that some return to it and it seems to lose something, uh, lose. It seems to learn something about who the ooze was attacking. At the beginning, it almost seems weak and you're amazed at the ease with which you are fighting it back. But the more you attack, the less your attacks affect it. At the beginning, the tendrils it was lashing out with we're just doing piercing damage. But one grows a club-like end after an ooze returns to it. Another crackles with lightning after a different ooze returns. You start to grasp how it's learning. Making headway, finally, a sorcerer lets out a fireball and some of the ooze grows back over the body once more. The artificer and the bard yell out, no fire! And the sorcerer looks abashed, but shifts their attacks. The bard and the artificer turn to each other, limbed in the glow of the battle, and smile at each other, their differences forgotten as they unite in a common goal. Everyone burns their spell slots, changing their attacks again and again, and eventually you see more ooze dripping away and dissolving instead of becoming little creatures. Little by little, you find what works and the ooze clears until you can see more and more of the original golden automaton appearing. You press your attacks and finally, the last of the ooze vanishes from the machine. Defeating bias in AI requires multi-pronged attacks. It isn't enough to just fix the data set. It isn't enough to uh, delete the offending categories. You need to systematically consider 
where the issues are coming from and where it is learned and what it is learned and how. You need to look at if you are tuning hyperparameters and see the results when you edit that tuning or turn it off. You need to examine the weighting you've applied to different factors. Explore your sample weights and test to make sure they're being counted. You can use them to add impact to some categories and downplay some others. You need to try different things and objectively compare the different results. You need to really look at your algorithms and make sure that every option is being considered and trained. You need to take a deep look at your data sets and the representation within. And you need to look at the confidence of your systems and the outputs to ensure that there's a balance. You may even need to bias it in other ways to counterbalance the original biases. Bias can come from the most innocuous of sources. It can come from background and labeled data. It can come from what you choose not to include just as much as what you choose to include. It can come from just not understanding that there are many different parts at play. My PhD is specifically looking at computer perceptions of gender. And as such, I've lived and breathed AI bias for the better part of three years. I've worked with deliberately biasing image generation systems and debiasing them and while training to see the results. I've worked with existing AI systems to show the gaps in large image data sets like MS Coco, and I've trained classifiers examining different levels of training and bias in the data set to achieve different artistic outcomes. Art is a wonderful tool to explore AI bias because it clearly illustrates the presence of bias and the need for greater diversity. I added fire as a restoration device deliberately as a nod to AI trolls. You cannot defeat AI with a flame war. And while sometimes it may feel like nuking it with fire may be the only way out, fighting fire with fire only makes the situation worse. You need to be clever to adapt and think carefully about how the algorithm learns and how it adapts the information you give it. AI doesn't always work in the way you think. Sometimes it focuses on the wrong idea, like medical AI systems that learn to identify rulers or medical equipment. The glowing motes of potential orbiting the bard fly around the party, bolstering you all for the final challenge. The artificer and the bard move towards the shining automaton and start speaking to it gently. Its eyes change and the motes start circling around it. A mote of inspiration, the music note. A mote of thought, the quill. And a mote of creation, the spanner. All of them orbit the automaton and it watches them dreamily. The bard starts to play. And as he does, a glowing mote erupts from your chest, from all of you a little symbol of something close to your heart, a mote of potential that only you can provide. You look around and each member of the party has a mote that swirls around their head before floating over to the automaton. The motes start to spin faster and faster, becoming a halo of lights. The colours merge into one bright light, too bright to look at and then are abruptly gone. And the echo of that light shining in the eyes of the now calm golden automaton. We all bring something to the table. We all have unique lived experiences and perspectives we can bring to help make AI systems, ideas and data sets more well-rounded. We all have a motive potential that can help make a system better just by asking what if, why, how? What can we do that will make a difference? Who does this AI help? Who does it harm? How can we make this AI more equitable? How do we prevent the mistakes of the past? 
How do we reflect the society we want to be rather than the one we have? In D&D, there's a bard college called the College of Creation. When a bard of the College of Creation casts inspiration, it creates a motive potential which can enhance abilities, attack rolls or saving throws. In this case, I have used it somewhat liberally as a literary device to show the potentiality of AI. AI is a motive potential. It can enhance our work. It can be a collaborator or it can attack. How it behaves is entirely up to the person using it. We are responsible for the AI we create and we are responsible for the damage it inflicts on others. We need to be aware, not just of its potential to create, but also of its potential to protect and assist and its potential to harm. In this talk, we've seen what it looks like when everything goes well, but what if everything goes wrong? What if your party isn't strong enough? You can always disengage and come back after a long rest to try again. You can buff yourselves and your co-workers, learn about the resources at hand, take a look at the code with fresh eyes, get someone else to look. You are a party after all. This task is not just on your shoulders, but on you all. This quest falls to you, to all of you, as a group, to find the bugs in the system, to look at the data sets and do the work, to find the areas that are being missed. This is not a task for one person, but for a team. And if you find that you're alone in this endeavour, if it's looking bleak, there are always resources online. There are mercenaries you can hire to help. There are elder gods like Google to consult, capricious in nature, but available whenever you need them. There are organizations such as the Algorithmic Justice League who can furnish you with information and assist you in your quest. You are never alone. Even when it feels dark, there are always others with shining lights ready to help you in your quest. The automaton is wide-eyed, friendly looking even. The lights from all those motes shining in its eyes, it turns to you placidly, waiting for your input. It's here to help you. That's all it ever wanted, was to help you in your tasks and make things easier. It's what you do with it that counts. What are you going to do next? Thank you. Thank you so much, Jay. That was lovely. <laughs> uh, can I get a round of applause for Jay in the chat and Venulus if we can? Um, we do have a couple of questions, uh, which I will go through. I'm going to take this one and paste it into the stream yard chat because it's quite long. Uh, but I'll read it out. Uh, how do you balance the needs to collect data for a data set with the privacy of the people whose data is being collected? In general AI, there may be third parties from whom it is very difficult to get per permission for data collection. For example, other road users train the AI for self-driving, but are not consulted on whether their data is collected or how it is used. Uh, see, this is an excellent question. It's a multi-pronged question too. Um, I think that, so ethics, or I, I guess being in a university environment, um, if you need to do anything involving other people, you need to um, put in ethics approvals, and that's it's a um, it's a complicated process. Uh, the eth AI ethics or any ethics approval at university levels, but um, I think it's actually an interesting roadmap. And while I don't think it needs to be as complicated as it is at university, I think that everybody actually probably needs to have some form of um, uh, ethics system that sort of like, yes, I will be using real people in this. I will be seeking their permission this way. They will be informed this way. They will be able to retract their information this way. And a lot of uh, large AI um, companies do literally none of this. If you have a data up on Flickr, if you have images on Flickr, they've been harvested. 
um, they're in um, multiple different AI data sets. If you've um, got a different, uh, if, if Facebook, of course, uses your data extremely liberally, uh, there are a lot of different ways. And it's, it's part of being extremely online, but it's also an issue. So for doing it yourself, it's actually um, really important to consider for, for my work. Um, I decided instead of using real people, I created 3D renders of people. So I never actually had to use them. Or I used um, uh, generated humans from uh, using uh, style ganto um, to dial in image parameters instead. So I work entirely with fabricated humans, which is my way of getting around that ethics. Oh no, is there a minute's left? <laughs> Sorry that's, about that's that. Uh, that was a big we can question. Put that, we, yeah, it's a good question. I'll, I'll put the, if we can get that one as well into the text chat afterwards, uh, if you want to talk more about it in there, that's absolutely welcome. Absolutely. Thank you so much, Shay. That was a really Thank good uh, talk and people in chat seemed really happy as well. Oh, um, yay, I'm glad. <laughs> next up, we have an afternoon tea break, I think, or yeah, yeah. Yeah, <laughs> we're back at 3.45. Um, with Gprof NG with which is the next generation new GNU profiling tool with Rude van der Pass. Uh, and I'll see you all back then in the Kia Ora Theatre.